You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hello, Patreon. How are you? I hope you are well. I'm sitting here with Bob. Hey, Bob. Hello, Matt. Hello, and everybody. What did we just finish, Bob? We just finished an interview with who? Christopher Gwynn. Christopher Gwynn. And he is the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Gettysburg National Military Park. And uh, I, we asked him to come in because last year we went to his winter lecture, which was called uh, Twilight of the Blue and Gray. It was awesome. It was great. It was about the 75th anniversary reunion. And... Uh, he came in, he sat down, he told us a little bit about what went on there, actually quite a lot about what went on there. But let me tell you a little bit about Chris. He is a 10-year veteran of the National Park Service. He's a 2006 graduate of Gettysburg College, and he holds a master's degree in public history. He has worked as an interpretive park ranger at Antietam National Battlefield, Boston National Historical Park, and the National Mall and Memorial Parks, where he created some of the first public programming conducted at the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. Currently, he's the Chief of Interpretation and Education at Gettysburg National Military Park. He manages and oversees all aspects of the visitor experience and has written numerous articles and journal entries on the Battle of Gettysburg and the Civil War era. And he is a great person to learn from. And if you listen, you'll find out whether they ran out of the booze or not at that <laughs> 1938 75th anniversary. <laughs> right. That is so important. That is probably the one detail that uh, really, really brought it home for me. Was the <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, as I always say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm learning, you're learning. So let's learn together. And Chris Gwynn is going to teach us a little bit about the 75th anniversary reunion. Hello, Chris. Hey, happy to be here. Okay, so the, the first thing I always ask people when they come on here for the first time is why Gettysburg? Why Gettysburg? What does that mean to you? For you why Gettysburg? What got you interested in it? Or whatever that word oh, why means. Okay. Why Gettysburg? You know, I think for me personally, uh, I came to the battlefield on vacation when I was very young. Uh, and it was a side trip, right? We were doing the stereotypical family vacation. And you know, we're from Massachusetts and we're going to D.C. or something yeah, like that. Yeah. We stopped at Chocolate World in Hershey. Sure. And we stopped at Gettysburg. And to this day, and I'm six years old at this this time this day, I don't remember a thing about that chocolate world visit, but something about here, Gettysburg captivated me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's anything that you can put words to. It's just, you know, why do, uh, why do people like the music that they do? Why right. do people like the food that they do? Uh, it, it was very much that kind of thing where it was just, it was just fascinating to me. And I, I've never been able to really explain why, but I know people feel the same way. Yeah. Uh, you know, why Gettysburg? I think people come here for moments of connection and transportation. And by transportation, I don't mean physical movement, but I right. mean they want to to experience something that is kind of beyond their grasp. Maybe they want to they uh, try to go back and, and see the world through a different set of eyes. And it's the eyes of the men that fought here 156 years ago. Yeah. And, and that's a very common, very common answer. We all kind of have the same thing. It's like, I came here as a kid and I don't know what happened, Yeah, but I'm stuck. And you've been to other <laughs> battlefields. I have, yeah. And they don't do the same thing to you as this place. Well, they do to no, a degree. Right? But you're not there. Uh, no, true, true, yeah. true. Um, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of working at Antietam National Battlefields. I've, I've worked at... Uh, the um, national monuments and memorials in D.C. from you know, the World War II Memorial to Lincoln. And they all have very special meaning to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, love, I love the Park Service and I love these places because they offer you moments of connection and transportation. You can go sure. there and it's real and you can be there and you can feel it. And it's, it's that communing with something that's authentic and real. Right. Gettysburg one the story it's it's so it's such a pivotal chapter in american history and it's it's a small park with a big name right mm. americans even if you only know it as you know the gettysburg address and that's really all you know it has that that name recognition yes. even, uh, europeans that come here uh gettysburg has that resonance and I think it's such an honor to be able to work at a place that has that and to tell this story and hopefully to tell it well and objectively. Yeah. Last winter, Bob and I went to see your lecture mm -hmm. 
about the 75th anniversary reunion. What was the title of that lecture? Twilight of the Blue and Gray. Twilight of the Blue and Gray. I like that. So reunions of uh, former enemies, right? Mm Mm-hmm. To me, that it seems kind of strange. Is that a strange thing? Is that a unique thing to the American Civil War or in history? Have we seen this before or since? Well, I would say we've certainly seen it since. And you can even look at uh, some of the events that have commemorated the First and Second World War, and you can see elements of this. You know, prior to the American Civil War, uh, relatively infrequent. I'm sure it happened, but the um, size and scope of what happens at Gettysburg in terms of these blue-gray reunions that happen after the war is really what makes the the post-Civil War period really significant in terms of these former foes, former combatants coming back to the battlefield together. I guess it's kind of unique, too, because they're fellow countrymen as opposed to the Germans and the French who really don't have to do anything together with each other ever again if they don't want to. Confederates, Union veterans, they're all Americans now again, and they got to figure out a way to get along. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot, I think, that's very unique about how our Civil War concludes and how it ends. Right. But, yeah, certainly there's a very different dynamic to these blue-gray reunions than otherwise. So in 1887, there's one. Mm -hmm. Um, Is this, this like, a big official thing, or is this kind of an impromptu thing? I, I wouldn't call it an impromptu thing, but I wouldn't call it an official thing either. It was what I would call a very kind of organic thing, and it happens on a, a relatively small scale between veterans of Pickett's Division mm-hmm. and elements of uh, the Philadelphia Brigade. So these are two units that end up facing each other on the battlefield on Cemetery Ridge July 3rd at this kind of climactic moment. Okay, so Webb and Pickett. Correct. Okay. And and so now how, how did that come about, though? Did, did somebody get an idea and then say, let's reach out to the other side and see if they want to come over? Wait, did- I, you know, I think you got to go back and, and look more holistically at how the battlefield develops in the, the post-war period. So Gettysburg, and I always try to stress this with, with visitors, Gettysburg really begins as a Union Memorial Park. Okay. It's a place where the Union cause is going to be celebrated. It's a place where the Union soldiers who fought here are going to be honored. And it has its origins. It has its genesis literally in the days, weeks, months following the battle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As Gettysburg's civilians, its leading citizens kind of recognize, hey, something momentous has happened here. Something important has happened here. And so they established this organization, the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And this this organization of these Gettysburg uh, citizens uh, has as its goal the, the creation of a monument or a memorial mm-hmm. to this Union victory at Gettysburg and the Union men that died here. But the, the radical element of this is that the monument is going to be the land. So we're going to preserve the battlefield. We're going to preserve the hills, the woods, the ridges where this you know, three-day conflict was waged and that's what they do they end up they go out and they purchase land they get a charter from the state of pennsylvania they become a land preservation organization which again is very very new and novel right. in terms of american history sure. it's really not how americans preserved land uh, previously right. right you know if they preserved land at all it was you know washington's home at mount vernon it wasn't a you know, battlefield park right if you will right so they go out and they preserve this land and end up creating this park and that allows Union veterans in the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s to not just come back to the battlefield, but to leave on the battlefield some kind of tangible reminder to future generations of who they were and what they did. And that's okay. the, the monuments the of monuments, the battlefields. Right. Of course, that's what that is. And so if you look at the battlefields in the, the post-war period, if you look at Gettysburg, there are large numbers of reunions. There are large numbers of veterans coming back to the battlefield and gathering and communing with one another, but it's primarily Union veterans. So the 72nd Pennsylvania is going to come back to the battlefield. That regimental association will come back Mm -hmm. and they'll have a reunion. The 2nd Massachusetts surviving veterans, they'll come back. They'll have a little reunion. These blue and gray reunions, though, the ones that get the most press, the ones that get the most attention, these, these reunions that seem to captivate imagination more than these others are these blue and gray right, reunions, right. which are relatively rare. They, they didn't happen a lot. Mm-hmm. 
part of the reason they get so much attention even today is that it's a rather unique and novel kind of thing to have happen. Sure, yeah. former combatants coming back to the battlefield. Yeah. And you uh, want to see them getting along. We want to see that. Sure. We don't want to see people fighting. Sure. And I would say even, you know, if you were to go out and, and talk to the veterans themselves, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we want to get along. Yeah. Provide there's caveats though. Okay. Th there's limits to that. We'll get along. I was brave. You were brave. <laughs> We're but all I was brave right. together. I was right. Oh, right, right. And you were wrong. And if you can admit that, it's, you know, it's generally the limits of these, yeah. these reasons. But that's the hardest part, though, is admitting the other guy was right. Right? Oh, Isn't sure. it easier to admit, yeah, 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 you're braver than me. Right? That's right, yeah. easier. I think you can always, I mean, it's easy to say, oh, yes, we were both brave. We both fought for what we believed in. But <laughs> Union veterans, they were right. Yeah. And Confederate veterans are going to say, well, you know, just because I lost doesn't mean I was wrong. And so, you know, one of the things that really fascinated me about these reunions is this kind of tension uh -huh. that's there. And so often we see images of these reunions and they're really, uh, they're great to look at. They're heartwarming. These old guys shaking hands across the stone wall. But to delve deeper into that story was what really fascinated me. To get beyond kind of that facade that right. patina of right. kind of romantic memories <laughs> and get to some of the more contested issues that were at the heart of these things. Well, okay. Now, so there, there is a handshake across the wall in the uh, 1887 reunion between Webb and Pickett's men. Mm -hmm. That's, but that's not the famous photograph everybody thinks of. No. And, and what I would say is that that handshake across the wall between Pickett's veterans and Webb's veterans mm -hmm. That was very much an almost organic expression that happened at that moment, right? So these are two former combatants that are meeting together on the battlefield. It wasn't necessarily choreographed the way that these future handshakes across the wall right. were. Uh, it happens again in 1913. It happens, you know, every every Remembrance Day in Gettysburg. Uh, the, yeah. the famous yeah. photograph that I uh, really was captivated by is uh, from the 38 reunion. Right. And it's a very famous photograph. I'm sure your listeners have probably seen it, but it's these two, you know, impossibly old men <laughs> shaking hands across the rock wall at, mm -hmm. at on Cemetery Ridge uh -huh. near the angle, not at the angle, but near the angle. And again, if you were to look at that, that picture certainly tells a story. Sure. These, these two men who maybe 75 years before were doing their best to try to destroy one another have been able to put that that bitterness and rancor aside and can now come back to the battlefield and as as brothers and as countrymen again, uh, bridge that divide that separated them in life and also ideologically. Right. But if you really look at that photograph, if you really try to pick it apart and examine it as a cultural artifact, I, th I think it paints a very different story. And I remember the first time I looked really critically at it, it's um, this, this beautiful photograph, and you have this solitary Confederate on the left and this little knot of uh, Union veterans on the right, and they're right. kind of milling about, with the exception of the one gentleman who's reaching across the wall. But if you look very carefully, there's a wire that runs down the length of the wall, and right beneath these two clenched hands, right, right beneath the handshake, is a microphone. And the more I thought about that, the more I thought, you know, well, that, this is... This is not some sort of organic thing. These two guys didn't just randomly bump into one another and there happened to be a photographer there. This was a really well choreographed moment. Mm -hmm. And it was um, it was well choreographed. They scheduled buses to bring these guys out here. The cameras were set up. It was it was a staged photo shoot. So what you have in this 38 reunion and this 38 image of these two guys shaking hands across the wall not so much this organic act of brotherhood, but a carefully choreographed piece of stagecraft to kind of uh, showcase this narrative. Mm -hmm. And the narrative of the reunion in 1938 was all about reconciliation. Mm -hmm. The horrors of war behind us, the scars of combat have healed, we're countrymen and we're brothers again. That was very much the narrative that was uh, right. uh, portrayed. But it's interesting, though, because, you know, you have at the 1887 one, you have an organic handshake. Yeah. <clears throat> and then it's done over and over again as media becomes more 
prevalent uh, motion pictures and radio sure. and things sure. like that. And, and people are able to have access to these things more. Um, everything seems to be more fake and staged and you know, it's just throughout the years since then. I mean, you got the flag raising at uh, Iwo Jima, right? But you know, and then everything up until today, everything seems to be staged and you know, not real, but it wa it's to depict a certain emotion that we want out there, mm -hmm. right? So can I- Yeah, go ahead, here? Bob. Just for the listener, um, Chris, the PBS documentary, Ken Burns, I think yeah. in one of the very opening segments, has video of these old veterans. Yeah, I believe sure. that was the 1938 yep. 75th anniversary that we're talking about. Um, are either of those guys the same as in the picture you're talking about? In the they still are. They're the, the same, they're the the same, same gentlemen. gentlemen. So okay. they have this, the still image, obviously, is, is what we're referring to now. Okay. But the Ken Burns series has newsreel footage of this exact same right. moment. And the, the Confederate uh, actually gives a kind of mimic of what the rebel yell sounded like. Uh, uh, so it's this very famous, very famous moment that's been uh, reproduced, not just in you know popular uh, productions like Ken Burns Civil War series, but uh, if you read a lot of uh, material on kind of the post-war period, it's this very famous image, very mm. famous moment. Mm. So the 1887 event is uh, so successful that in 1913, the veterans, Union veterans want to have a peace jubilee, right? Correct. Um, how do they make that a reality? Like what, what, who puts it on? Who shows up? Where was it held? It's massive. So the 1913 uh, gathering, the 50th anniversary, the reunion, the grand or great peace jubilee uh, is massive. It's right. massive. I mean, we're talking veterans who come not in the hundreds, but in the thousands. I think it's over 50,000 veterans attend. And it's very much, and this is again what separates it from what will happen in 1938. It is very much a veterans organized event. So the driving force behind it are these union veterans who uh, through the Grand Army of the Republic and these other veterans organizations really strive to to create it and to make it happen. And of course, they're working with the state government. They're working with the federal government. Woodrow Wilson, for example, attends. Mm -hmm. But it's it's something that comes from the veterans themselves. It's a an evoke uh, an evocation of 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 how they feel. OK, which 1938, as maybe we'll talk about, it's not really the case. It's right, right. other entities creating that event. So I think uh, you have about 52,000 that show up. Mm -hmm. You have 44,000 Union, 8,694 Confederates. Yeah. Can I, um, if, yeah, go if ahead. If you're going off 1913, can I ask a question? We're still on 1913. Okay. Go ahead, sure. Yeah. Okay. Just go. Um, African American inclusion in the 1913 50th anniversary. Oh, by and they're there, but as laborers usually. Mm -hmm. So the. Um, you know, veterans of the United States colored troops, they're, they're not really part of it. Uh, you'll have African-Americans who, again, help set up the tents, who perform kind of the uh, manual labor that that is the, the bedrock and infrastructure of this massive event. But African-American veterans of the war are not really part of this. They're marginalized in the 1913 uh, reunion. There may have been one or two here or there, uh, small groups. But I've never read of anything of any real uh, size. Are, are you aware of any um, effort on the part of the veterans groups, the white veteran groups, to purposely exclude them? I, I've never seen anything uh, up front. Uh, it's tough for me, having not really delved into that subject, to be able to answer coherently. Uh, what I will say is when you look at what uh, the African-American community is writing about the 1938 reunion, it is very different than mm. uh, some of the coverage the 1913 reunion gets, which was, I think, regarded by and large by the African-American communi community as a reunion for white veterans that they weren't really a part of. Very different in 1938. There's a new book that came out about the 1913 reunion. The name of the author is Escaping Me. But uh, I would encourage your uh, listeners to, to go out and get a copy that came out this year. Okay. And it's um it's been highly uh, I think spoken I, Is it of. at the Visitor Center in the bookstore? Is, yeah, yeah, I've seen is. it. I can't remember the name of it. 
I never remember authors' names, so I just go by the titles of the book. <laughs> I'd encourage you, again, yeah. your listeners, to take a look. I'll, at I'll try to find it and I'll put a link to it in yeah. the uh, description. Uh, but so now, let's nineteen thirteen. We're in nineteen thirteen. What is what is the national park like at that point? Are you is the Park Service is that still in the War Department at that point, or is it? Yeah, the, yeah? it's a War Department site. So in, in eighteen ninety five, the Battlefield Memorial Association transfers the land over to the War Department. Okay. Uh, you know, the Department of Defense today. And the, the War Department, they do a lot of wonderful things on mm -hmm. the battlefield park. They really create a lot of the infrastructure that visitors to the battlefield still utilize today. Many of the roads are created during this period of time. The battlefield towers are erected. Uh, they they extensively mark the battlefield through how we call the War Department tablets that are right. Those, you know, those like iron. Yeah, yeah. yeah they, they dot the landscape today. Uh, they they utilize the battlefield land very differently than the National Park Service would. A perfect example of that is Camp Colt, the tank training right. facility. It's located on the battlefield during the First World War. Um, but it's managed by the United States War Department. And that changes in 1933, only a few years before the 38 reunion, when the land is transferred over to the National Park Service. And the Park Service had been around since 1916, so it's, you know, mm -hmm. been 30 plus years. But primarily the, the Park Service had been involved in managing wilderness areas. So, you know, Yellowstone, Yosemite, these icons of the West. Right. The idea that the Park Service would take on these battlefield parks was very new. Uh, it was, you know, it was an experiment, really, that was part of the, the Roosevelt administration. So 1933, the War Department moves out, and now the National Park Service will move in. And um, that, But it's still called Gettysburg National Military Park. Correct. But the military Correct. really has no more use for it, or? Well, I wouldn't say they have no more use for it. And even today, the military utilize the battlefield as an active outdoor classroom. Sure. But, but they can do that anywhere at Antietam, which oh, is sure, not sure, a sure. national military sure. park. Yeah. And really, when you get down to the kind of the difference between a national military park and a national battlefield, it's really in terms of how the Park Service manages the site, really semantics more than anything. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it, for example, like they might have used it as a, well, they did. They used it as a POW camp at one point. Yeah, yes, sure. Right. Um, but it was, it was in the Park Service. That was Park Service's tenure. But yeah. it was still used for a military purpose. Sure, sure. Um, did that happen at that time with any other uh, parks that were battlefields that were in the park services oh absolutely uh, if you look at did. um chickamauga okay. perfect example of that and that's not a national military park that is a national uh -huh. military park so chickamauga chattanooga is actually the first national military park or one of uh okay. administered by the war department and that's actively used uh, as far back as the spanish american war actually but throughout world war one and world war two so, but how about say like because isn't antietam let's say that's a, a battlefield park it's right a, it's a national battlefield so so that was that was that used in any way do you know you know uh, i, I don't know this know is not what we're really talking kind of about major but. military presence at antietam national battlefield um none that i can think of right and really when you talk about you know, the, the terminology that we use, the national military parks that we have, and there's a number of them, Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Vicksburg, Chickamauga, Chattanooga, Gettysburg, really has to do more than anything relative to when they become parks. Right. Okay. Those national military parks tend to be the earliest ones that are that are taken in by the federal government. Gotcha. Okay. All right. That, that's just an aside. I was just always curious about that yeah. designation there. So, all right. Um, the uh, Tell us about James McConaughey. Is it McConaughey? McConaughey yeah, yeah, I couldn't read my own writing. Well, he's a, he's a um, he's got a big job. So he's the first superintendent to manage Gettysburg National Military Park. When is he serving? He, he comes in when the Park Service takes over in 1933, and okay. he will be the one that kind of invents the role of superintendent at Gettysburg. And, okay, a you know, big part of his role is, is building the park, right? And uh, the 1938 reunion is one of his first major events. He's um he's uh, not a historian by trade. He's, I believe, a landscape architect. Right, right. And he still has very much of that Western Park ethos, right? So he views the battlefield through this very kind of unique lens. Mm. And he, I mean, he did some amazing work. Again, a lot of the infrastructure that visitors still use comes about during this period. He creates the first kind of visitor center, if you will. He uh, helps develop the 
uh, driving tour of the park that is in one shape or another still utilized today. Mm -hmm. uh, he thought the battlefield was too crowded with monuments. So at one point he embarked on this program to plant trees around monuments to try to <laughs> cover them up, essentially. Oh, God. He had some wonky ideas, yeah. but um, yeah. he really uh, he really creates the role of superintendent at the park right. in a way that is still kind of emulated today. It looks like here you say uh, he establishes civilian camps full of workers who would pave the roads. So it's it's interesting. Um, the Depression, just yeah. when, when he takes over and when the park is transferred to the, the MPS. For most Americans, it's a time of, of you know, desperation, uh, poverty, uh, certainly uh, fairly crippling economic circumstances in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. For the Park Service, it was a time of, of plenty because the Roosevelt administration through these public works projects is just funneling money and, mm. and labor and manpower into these parks. Mm. So uh, the, there are civilian conservation corps camps that dot the Gettysburg battlefield where trails are built. Where, where, where are those camps? Where were they put? There's a couple of them. One of them is uh, the site, basically the site of McMillan Woods Youth Campground today oh, okay. on Seminary Ridge. Okay. There was another one further down about where the park amphitheater is. Okay. Makes uh, sense. Those make sense. Yeah. 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 And these are, um, these are, again, civilian conservation corps camps, CCC camps. Uh -huh. And I think even more meaningful, a number of them are African-American. Right. Civilian Conservation Corps camps. Okay, um, and uh, now it's, it's you wrote here, or you didn't write this. I wrote this based off of your lecture. It says uh, you, they built comfort stations. Yeah, is that like the the West End Guide stations? Or you remember the old? There used to be one down by Devil's Den. Uh, oh yeah, until recently it was restrooms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's one by the Pennsylvania Memorial. Oh, okay. one over at oh that's what they built. Okay, comfort stations. Yeah, yeah. All right. You need bathrooms when you go to parks. I thought it was a place to take a nap. Um, okay, 19 miles of trails and much more. I don't know if I wrote that because you moved on to the next subject and I couldn't remember what you wrote or if you said that, but um, can you think of anything else that he did? Uh, trails, fences, they leveled the stones in the National Cemetery. They used to be raised. If you go there today, oh, yeah. they're flush, they're oh, flat. Yeah. Uh, that's that's early park service, and that was really a, a time and energy and money saving. Why? Why? What was it was the easier to mow around. Mowing. It's always about mowing. Mow around. And over time, and over time, the tablets got kind of crooked. They got a yeah. jar. So they so, don't. They, yeah. they, I think it looks nice when they're flush anyway. So because because then you walk up to them, and then it's it, it's more of a punch in the gut when you walk up to like New York. Yeah. And you see how many there are, it, but you don't see them far away. You got to walk up to them within a few feet. You're like, oh my god! And then you actually see the number. You know. Um, all right, so uh, so you got the the Park Service now. Um, McConaughey comes in, and it's a time where the Civil War and the veterans uh, were transitioning from uh, living memory to yeah. history. I think is yeah what you say, and uh, and so one of the things that he's going to do is he's going to now. Here's something interesting though: the 1913 reunion, the governor at the time. I can't remember his name. It was John Tenor. Tenor, thank you. Yeah, right here, John Tenor. He promises to invite the veterans back for the 75th Correct. anniversary. He pledges on the part of the state of Pennsylvania to and bring them back one last time. Something unprecedented and miraculous happens here. A politician upholds the promise of a predecessor. <laughs> Forget about himself, a predecessor. So who's the governor in 38? Do we know? Do you remember? Oh, you're testing me now. Okay. Because I, I didn't have it in my notes. Yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> All right. There's a governor in 38 who had no name. <laughs> and and this governor ho holds the promise. Now, what, what does he have to go through in order to, ha first of all, how many veterans are even left at this point? I mean, this uh, is seventy five years since the battle. Yeah, average lifespan at that time. What was it, what was the expect life expectancy back then? Oh, that's a good question. So for, for not the what Civil War today. generation, I mean, no, they're wasn't. dying at a, a remarkable rate. And you know, the, one of the biggest challenges of of many for the thirty eight reunion is the fact that okay, great, you want to have these guys come back to the battlefield, but the simple you know mortality rate. Uh, you know, they would send out uh, kind of an RSVP to 8,000 veterans. And then the next year, they'd send out another one. And the number of veterans still alive had decreased by thousands. So 
time was really not on their side. Is that how they kept track of that? In, in part. But in basically, part. are you still here? Please send this back. Basically, so they'd wow. send out um, they send out a survey. So you know, are you interested in coming back to the battlefield? Ah. And they'd send out X number, and they would get that usually from the pension office, and they would send out one the following year as more of an RSVP type of thing. Uh -huh. And just the the remarkable decrease in numbers of veterans was staggering. So and so it was really a in some sense, kind of a race against the clock to have this event. Um, I found here in the notes, uh, 1913 and 1935, average 1,000 Civil War veterans die each year. So, yeah, you're losing them at a pretty high rate at this point. So now, okay, it's 1938. Um, Governor Nameless, he, he has this task before him, not he, of course, but his team that he's going to assign this chore to, to uh, put this uh, uh, reunion together. So what are some of the obstacles? Because the the politics have changed sure. now. Um, we're still in the depression. What's what's going on? How, what does he have to, what are, what are the headaches that he's we got to deal um, with? So his name is George Earl, actually. I just looked it up. Earl? George Earl. E-A-R-L? E-A-R-L-E. E, damn it. George There's always Earl. an E. So they create a commission uh, to um, manage this event. Very little money to work with the initially. Veterans are dying off at a fairly precipitous rate. And, you know, a, a larger issue at the time was that, do Americans still care? Mm. It's the Depression. It's difficult to care about the past when you don't know how you're going to feed your kids. Right. It's difficult to be interested in these old Civil War veterans when you don't know what you're going to do for work tomorrow. Right. And so, you know, Americans' attention span has kind of you moved mm. on. And then, of course, there's the situation abroad in Europe and in Asia where uh, we're kind of hurtling towards this this conflict uh, in a few years that will engulf the globe. And so, you know, a big question is, do Americans care? Mm -hmm. Is this even worth it? Is there any interest? How are we gonna get the money? And the biggest issue beyond the age of the veterans was, do the veterans actually wanna do this? Mm. And there had not been a major blue-gray joint reunion since 1913. Okay. And one of the challenges of this commission, uh, one man in particular, a guy by the name of Paul Roy, is going to be going out there, communicating with these veterans and trying to encourage them to, in 1938, as 95 and 96 and 97 year old you know, <laughs> men to leave the comfort of their homes behind, right. travel, in some cases, hundreds of miles to attend this reunion at Gettysburg in the middle of the summer where you're going to be sleeping in tents out in the battlefield, uh, encouraging them to do this. And, and that was a huge challenge that the commission, specifically that guy Paul Roy, as a, kind of the executive assistant, had to uh, tackle. Mm. And um, what, do you, what was the average age of the veterans at that point? Well, what I would say is the, the sound bite that you often get is uh, the average age is about 94. Right. What I will tell you is we actually don't know. Okay. So one of the things that you know, really interested me in looking at this event is getting beyond that kind of facade that I that I talked about earlier. And as I dug and as I looked into some of these individuals' cases, a lot of times they had no idea how old they were. Uh, many times they lied. Right. Uh, you know, there's this kind of, uh, everybody wanted to be either the youngest guy at the reunion or the <laughs> oldest guy at the reunion. And in some cases, the individuals were just simply confused. Yeah. Uh, one individual in particular, the oldest man who claimed to be 112, uh, was was he was an African American, a former slave. He was born in, in servitude. He had no idea how old he was, so he kind of sure. guessed. Yeah. And there were other men, uh, particularly on the Confederate side, that uh, added uh, to their age to qualify for pensions. So some men that you know were five years old during the Civil War, uh, but claimed to be veterans, so they could get a pension. Yeah, and they back, back when that was easy to do. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit more difficult now. Um, so okay, so then we don't really know what the youngest vet is because we don't, we don't know, know what, what the, the we don't know anything about these. I would ages. say if you're if you're talking about averages, it's in the mid nineties. Now, at the seventy fifth, how many total veterans were there? A good number to throw out is about 1,845. So barely 2,000. Correct. And these are not Gettysburg veterans. These no. are Civil War veterans. These are Civil War veterans. Blue so, and gray. Blue and gray. There were a few, a relative few, that were at the battle. But by and large, most of them were, you know, they might have been in Grant's Army. They might have been uh, 
Uh, it might have been with uh, uh, Albert Cindy Johnston at Shiloh. Very few of the total number were actually at Gettysburg. Maybe 60 or so. But uh, Really? That yeah. little? Um, but uh, there were some actual Adams County uh, veterans? I oh, there was a number. There was yeah. a number from Adams County. Um, uh, one from Littlestown, for example. I mean, I live in Littlestown right down the road. Mm -hmm. And he had been um, a, a volunteer in uh, one of the Pennsylvania regiments. And he had, you know... I forget his name, George. Uh, George, I believe I have it here. George Krug, That's 92. It. Yeah. He, um, there. Damn it. You know, when you look at some of these men are traveling from California. Yeah. Uh, and this guy's 10 miles down the road. Yeah. And was That's that the amazing, furthest? Though. California, was that the furthest? California, uh, Overton Mennett, who's actually the uh, commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, was from Los Angeles. So. I mean, he had literally a cross-country journey to get to Gettysburg. Yeah, by train, wow. no doubt. Train. Is, is, I, I've heard before that Congress offered to pay the train fare for people to come. Have you heard of Yes. Like that? So if you are a veteran, Union, Confederate, doesn't matter, the government will pay for your expenses to get to the battlefield, uh, as well as a, an attendant to to basically take care of you during the trip. So was that that well, oh, during the trip? So yeah. that wasn't the Boy Scouts. That's once they're here. No, no. So every veteran had an attendant usually with them, um, okay. and it's kind of like a caretaker and a valet. A valet. Oh, uh, so that would be the veteran's choice. Like maybe if he's at a, I don't know if he's at a nursing home or not, but maybe if a favorite yeah. nurse or a daughter or someone would. Yeah, or family member. So yeah, they would um, they would pay for that individual gotcha. to accompany you to the battlefield. Again, yeah. these men are mid 90s various uh levels of functioning yeah. and it was an arduous journey uh, mm, and, sure. you know in, in in researching i came across this one gentleman who uh was a virginia veteran who was traveling from texas he was a gettysburg veteran too he fought at culp sale where he was wounded and on the train ride north he fell out of his bunk and ends up injuring himself and he breaks his shoulder oh my and his one wish was to go to gettysburg to go to Culp's Hill and to see this, uh, see the spot where he, where he fought. And as literally as the train's kind of rounding this bend in Baltimore, this old man falls out of his, his berth, uh, breaks, again, I think his shoulder, spends the entire reunion in a hospital oh. and survives long enough to make it back to Texas, but that September dies. So you can mm. kind of look at him as, you know, one of the last casualties <laughs> of the battle. Yeah, yeah. Died but he never made it here. Um, how far would you say was the average distance they're coming? Oh, it's a couple hundred miles. It's a couple hundred miles. I thought I heard, and I thought I got this from you, so my memory might be wrong, but I thought I heard, Yeah, that's what I was going to say. That's, at least that's what I use yeah. on tours. See how influential your <laughs> lectures are? <laughs> <laughs> Again, 700 miles in 1930. That's a lot. That's a long, that's a long sure. journey today. I was just going to say. a long journey today. I don't want to do that. No. 200 miles, I'm done. <laughs> and that's in a car. And, and how many days was it? The reunion itself? Yeah. Well, the, the official reunion covers really the battle anniversary in July 4th, July 1, 2, and 3. Okay. So. But most of these veterans arrive in, you know, June 28th, June 29th, June 30th. There's one veteran that arrives weeks ahead of time. There's this uh, yeah, kind of I was palpable gonna... excitement. Well, now he, he cuts here weeks ahead of time so he could have the pick of the Gettysburg ladies, That's right? correct. That's that is he correct. Says. And he, uh, <laughs> and I, I joke, he, he, brought his like wife you, the, uh, yeah. he brought his wife to the, the reunion with him. Well, all right. So before we get into funny anecdotes, though, because um, I know there's probably a couple of them that, besides that one, though, um, there are some controversies, though, with the 1938 uh, reunion. Yeah. The Confederate flag is an issue. Yeah. To, to get back you know, to what we were talking about, this, this man, Paul Roy, who was on the commission, He's not a Civil War veteran. He's a young guy at the time. Mm -hmm. But he's the one that has to go out and convince these veterans to make the journey to Gettysburg. And both sides, blue and gray, really didn't showcase a whole lot of interest in the idea. And so he really has to pitch this event to them. So there's a reunion of the United Confederate Veterans, Confederate Veterans Organization, down in Amarillo, Texas. And I want to say this is in 1935. Okay. And Roy goes down there uninvited to try to convince the head of the United Confederate Veterans, a guy by the name of Harry Lee, no relation to Robert E. Lee, uh, to, to convince this man, Lee, to support the, the idea of the reunion. And he gets down there, has a very kind of cold reception, uh, basically ambushes Lee in the lobby of this hotel where the event is taking place and, and tries to persuade him to go to Gettysburg, and this guy, uh, Lee, basically said, yeah, you can go to hell, I'm not going to Gettysburg. <laughs> and so he really had to work at it. He really had to kind of convince them 
to 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 attend. But why, if everything in 1913 was, if people were more into it than, or were they? To a degree, to a degree. I think the big thing in 1913, it was the veterans themselves that were really at the the core of the event. Whereas in 1938, it's this commission from okay. Pennsylvania, a whole bunch of guys that are in their 30s and 40s, not not veterans who are trying to um, trying to get this thing off the ground. And I think the biggest thing is, you know, from the Confederate veteran perspective, they didn't want to go up there and be paraded around like, you know, captured trophies of war. Uh, there's very much this kind of lost cause uh, mentality mm. where, you know, just because I lost didn't mean I was wrong. Uh, and then on the other hand, you know, Union veterans, they didn't want the Confederate battle flag to be shown. They didn't want it to be given, you know, equal airtime, if you will, with the, the American flag. Union veterans are like, no, you might be brave and you might have been a good soldier, but you were still wrong. And I was right. And we won. And don't forget it. <laughs> and so, the, you know, oftentimes we we in our national debate, we think about this uh, dialogue we're having about Confederate monuments and memorials and flags as this kind of n recent phenomenon. No, mm. we've been debating this for 150 yeah. odd years. Just the reasons change. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's cyclical, right? We'll go right. back to the same kind of things over and over again. So the Confederate flag was a flashpoint. And uh, Paul Roy, to kind of convince the Confederates to attend, says, you know, you can bring your battle flags with you. And then it'll go to Grand Rapids, Michigan, where Union veterans are having their uh, Grand Army of the Republic annual encampment. And he makes the same pitch to them. Come to the Gettysburg reunion. Uh, we're going to avoid any kind of embarrassing incidents that will, uh, you know, might, might upset you. You don't have to walk under the Confederate flag. You don't have to see the Confederate flag. It'll be over in the Confederate camp. And that's basically the pitch that he makes to them. Now, the GAR will never accept the invitation as an entity. They simply allow the individual veterans the choice. So to if go you want to go, you can, but you we're can. not endorsing yeah. it or exactly. Right. Exactly. So you, you, you're talking about camps and um, you keep talking about uh, Paul Roy, Paul Roy. Um, but there's another Paul who had a pretty big task before him. And that was uh, Colonel Paul Hawley. Correct. And what now? What was he in charge of, and what did he have to do? Because this could not have been easy. No, he's um he's a medical officer. Yeah. So he's the guy in charge of when the veterans come here, I'm going to take care of you. Thousands of ninety year olds. Exactly. He has basically. I think. I think I wrote in. You must have said this. That he uh, basically has to create a, a nursing home. Oh yeah yeah yeah. Um. So he yeah, he's in command of the first medical regiment or first medical detachment. And basically what he has to create is this giant mobile nursing home that's kind of kind of plant itself on the Gettysburg battlefield for the, the course of this reunion. And Holly, it's um, an enormous, an enormous task. Sure. And so they're going to establish a hospital on the grounds of Gettysburg College. They're going to work with the local hospital as well. They're going to establish these kind of first aid stations around the battlefield. And it's a, it's a in terms of, of Holly's involvement, it's this really well-oiled, well-managed event. But Holly's going into this with the, the the opinion that he's going to have to take care of thousands of patients. He's uh, anticipating a fairly high uh, mortality rate. I mean, he's thinking even under the best conditions, these, these guys are going to die. Mm. These guys are going to die when they come And here. did he have any mortality uh, or uh, deaths, I should say? Well, you know, one of the... Uh, he did. He, he did. did. One of the kind of sound bites that you sometimes hear is that during the reunion, no veterans died. And, and that, that's, not, that's not entirely accurate. Okay. Uh, what you're going to have are no veterans will expire on July 1, July 2, or July 3. But they died before and they died after. Um, so like June 30th or July exactly, 4th. Exactly. Or on the way home, they'll, they'll expire. Or some you know, languish in Gettysburg for a, you know, a week uh, as a result of the reunion. Mm. Relatively speaking, though, during the reunion itself, uh, and, and even before and after, all told, when you got 1,845 veterans coming back to the battlefield, you would expect, you know, hundreds of these guys to die. And in reality, it was um, uh, relatively few. Uh, the Gettysburg Times put the number at three that died during the event itself. A further six kind of perish on the way home. 
But that is really small. Out of 1,845, that's not bad considering these guys are 97 years old. You would imagine they would be prepared for it. Right. For it. I, I, thought, prepared. I thought I heard this from your talk, but correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe they were dying at a rate of about 15 a day in their nursing homes? Uh, yeah. This yeah. generation. So they, they, they tried to estimate under normal conditions how many veterans would just die normally mm. in, a, in a span of you know a week or four days. Yeah. Uh, never mind veterans that are undergoing this epic journey across country in a train, the yeah. mental excitement of, you know, taking part in this kind of grand event. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact that you know, it's Pennsylvania, it's summer, it's yeah. hot. I have a couple things here that I just jotted down. I'm, I'm assuming this is all of the uh, infrastructure and logistics that uh, took, pl that was required for this. And I just started jotting them down, but I don't have any context for them in my notes here. Um, 55 mess tents. <laughs> yep. Okay. Uh, 30 miles of telephone. Correct. Very interesting. Yep. 30 miles of telephone. Uh, there was a 23,000 seat arena built. Correct. Where was this? Uh, so if you are familiar with the campus of Gettysburg College. Yeah. Uh, right next to where the College Union building is today. Uh, very close to the Apple dormitory. Uh, that, right in the it's in the heart of the campus. The Apple, what is that? Apple Apple Hall. No, I, I don't know. I don't know it that well. Uh, is that the building that they just renovated? It is. Yeah. Okay, I know what you're yeah. talking it's about. The Janet the, Morgan Riggs College Union building. Yeah, right? the Union building. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. So that's like right by where I live. Yeah. So that's like right, right there. there. Wow. Okay. And then um, the uh, PA Hall was the hospital. Correct. Glattfelder Hall was the headquarters. Yep. I guess the headquarters of the whole operation. Correct. Okay. Um, there were, of course, tents, lamps, toilets, spring beds. Yep. Every veteran had a, a tent that was fully equipped with everything a you know a geriatric Civil War veteran would need: uh, water, pitcher, cabinet, soap, towels, drink oh. cup, umbrella, rubber seated pads, right. canes. So I'm I'm looking at the okay here I'm just trying to discern my own notes here. So in the tents there were lamps, toilets, spring beds, yeah. mosquito netting, and a sitting area. It's a fully furnished tent wow. is what they they they, got. they were glamping <laughs> before that was a word. <laughs> um, okay, and then we said before the first vet to show up showed up on uh, June sixteenth early because yep. he wanted the pick of the Gettysburg women. That was Alvin Tolman. <laughs> Now there was okay, so we got three days of the reunion. Okay, Correct, guys, yeah. there were three days of the battle, and now each day was themed. Yes. So what's what were the themes and what were the big highlights of those days to celebrate that theme? But the, the I mean the uh, the kind of the 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 high point was uh, what was referred to as Memorial Day or President's Day, which was on July third, and that of course is when the uh, Eternal Light Peace Memorial was uh, dedicated mm -hmm. but uh, on july 2nd you had veterans day and uh, the first of july was reunion day that was kind of the the kickoff of the larger event so each day was again kind of thematically organized all building up to this crescendo the dedication of the peace light and um did the governor fall out of his chair he did fall out of his chair, yeah. yes, at the opening ceremony. <laughs> uh, and then, okay, July 2nd, Veterans Day. Um, they also have um, a parade. They have B-17s uh, flying overhead mm -hmm. and artillery demonstrations. So it was a an opportunity to showcase the might of the modern American military while at the same time kind of hearkening back to the American Civil War. So I always imagined if, you know, I'm one of these these veterans who fought at Cold Harbor or Antietam, yeah. and uh, I'm watching a, a B-17 <laughs> yeah. fly overhead. I'm seeing field artillery, mechanized uh, cow. Yeah. It's just, it must have been- uh, Machine guns. Yeah, it must have been a surreal experience for them. You know, in a lot of ways, we have more in common with the 1938 generation than the Civil War veterans uh, you had, had in common with them. The, yeah. the, the, to go from, yeah, I'm gonna march down these dusty roads as a you know a 22 year old in the army of the potomac to live and to see again flight and right. the, the, the advancement of technology and radio and right. film uh, it was it was must have been a very much a surreal experience for them oh that's what i'm saying it had to be insane to go from i mean like everything was i guess for lack of a better term analog Right. Like you wanted to light something, you had to strike a match yeah. and you had to make a flame. You wanted to heat something. Same thing. You yeah. wanted to cook something. Same thing. You wanted to cool off. Good luck. Yeah. Go find a stream <laughs> and jump in it. Like 
And they and wouldn't now, have a clue every, what analog means. <laughs> no, exa- and that's right. Yeah. And, and, and then by the end of your life, if you're lucky to have lived that long, there's automobiles, there's airplanes, uh, you know, all this stuff is becoming automated. There's electricity, you flip a switch and now you have light. And, yeah. you know, I mean, by the time the last veteran dies, we're in the atomic era. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's something that I often, it just boggles my mind because they're so different from when they were born to when they, the last one died is such a difference in technology and just thought and the way people think and the way society works and everything. And we think that it's so long ago and so far removed from us today, but it's really not. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not. And uh, again, that was another aspect of the story that really interested me. The, the 38 reunion is really kind of the last chapter in the lived memory of the Civil War. Mm-hmm. And, you know, working at the National Park, even even today, you'll still, although it's happening less and less frequently, you'll still encounter people who remember the 38 reunion, who remember as, as young, young kids. Yeah, right. Seeing these Civil War veterans parade down their street. Yeah. My, my mom, we just put her in the ground a year and a half ago as we sit here in 2019. She died in 2018. Yeah. And she has in her memory or had um, what we would call Memorial Day parades with Civil War soldiers. Old wow. people. How old was and she when she died? She was 90s, almost 97. Oh, wow. But... Um, it was her grandfather that was a veteran of the Civil War, and that's whose musket, oh, that's whose that's musket, whose musket have. I have over yeah. my mantle. Correct. Okay. So um, I don't know how old you guys are or if you had relatives who fought in the I'm war. I'm 28. Um, You're 28, <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, my, my people uh, came over in the turn of the, after the turn of the century, or at the right. turn of the century. So um, we might, <laughs> we're trying to find now and my one grandmother, her people go back to the 1700s as far as we could see, but I can't find any records of a relative okay. in the Civil War. But still, a great grandfather is all it is of me. When I'm giving yeah. tours, I often yeah. ask kids, raise your hand if you've ever met your great grandparents. And often a lot of kids have their hands raised. These sure. days, they know like right. three greats. Right. Yeah. And for pe- most people my age, I'm 63 right now. Most people my age, it would be a great great grandfather. Right. But my mom was one of 13 kids, and I'm the youngest of her five kids. So. Okay. But still, it's it's pretty amazing. I point to that statue of Albert Wilson um, right by the Bryan farm at the end of a tour. And I'll say that guy and I were alive on this planet at the same time. Mm. Yeah. And uh, that's I'm, not I'm, too far away. One no. of my one of my hopes. I, I, I don't know if I really want this to be, but is to be alive at the 200th anniversary. How many? What year is this? This would be 2063. This would be 2063. Would be the 200th anniversary, and I would be 107. Uh, uh, yeah, you'll make it. You might not know where you are, bodies. but I would still. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm not, not the way I'm going. I, I would still be two years younger than Albert Wilson when he died. That's pretty amazing. August of 1956. Wow. wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's possible. But wouldn't it be yeah. cool? They could say, "Hey, there's this guy who's at this reunion who was alive when that." Oh yeah. yeah. And and. I hope there's someone who can do that. And they yeah. can take a picture of someone who was alive when Albert Wilson was alive. That would be awesome. Yeah. At the 200th yeah. anniversary. That would be crazy. And I think, I think you would probably be crazy. If you lived that long, you would, you would, you wouldn't know where I you are. I wouldn't remember who I am, man. I have a hard time. But, I, but I'll wheel you along if I survive. Thank you, man. Yeah. If I make it that long, I'll wheel you along and I'll say he was alive. When the last veteran, no, Chris, did, did you have any relatives who fought in the war or anything? Oh, I did. I did on my father's side. Yeah. What uh, what, what uh, unit or whatever. Confederates? Yeah. Really? Confederates. Oh. My grandfather grew up in West Virginia, which even though it was kind of a unionist uh, right. state, was a. Uh, was, were they here at Gettysburg? No, 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 no. Very no. <laughs> cool. Um, I don't know what they were doing. <laughs> For the first two days, you have about 20,000 spectators, yeah, I guess we'll call them. I would say modest crowds. Is that a day or It's total? a day. It's a day. All right. So that's not bad. Oh, it's probably the same people. It could be. But the big thing is by, by July 3rd, right. you're talking about hundreds of thousands. Yeah, that's the number. 450,000? It gets so busy that the state police actually start begin to turn people away on the roads leading to Gettysburg. That's birth. crazy. So, all right. let's. It's the biggest event. Including the battle to ever happen in, in Adams County. Is that right? Wow. It, it, yeah? 450,000 people. Oh, wow. It's the biggest event to ever happen in Adams County. So let's try to set the stage then. So they're dedicating the Peace Light, right? Correct. Which is over on Oak Hill. Correct. Off of the Mummersburg Road. Yep. Um, how do they have that set up there? Because I've seen film footage of FDR 
talking. Is that where he is? The um, the platform where Roosevelt and the other dignitaries would have spoken from was was in front of and slightly to uh to the side of the peace light. Okay. And in the field, so if you were to stand at the peace light today, mm-hmm. and the monument is directly behind you. Okay. And you look to the south. You mm-hmm. can see the parking area, the Moomisburg Road. In the far distance, you might see the bridge traversing the railroad cut. And in the far, far distance, you'd see the McPherson barn. Mm-hmm. Virtually the entire swath from the Peace Light past the Moomisburg Road, all the way almost to the railroad cut, is just packed with this throng of humanity. So that was my and next question. That's about three-fourths of a mile, I think. Because I think it's about a mile to the McPherson yeah. barn. Oh, yeah, you that's half imagine a million people. This it's almost like Woodstock. Sea of people, yeah. Woodstock's a great way to think about yeah. it. And they're all here to see this event, though. They're yeah. all here to, to take part in this this moment. They're here to see the president, to see this monument unveiled. I can't. This, this is something I've all, often, like, the, the sound system couldn't have been that great back then. That they could have heard <laughs> from, you know, to the McPherson barn. Like they, And I don't think that's even the point. I think it's I know. To, to be there. Yeah. It's the same thing with the uh, dedication of the Soldiers National Cemetery. And, you know, right. often, you know, we're out on the battlefield, but I'm sure you get this, too. Uh, you'll talk about the the dedication and how many people were there, and it's you know numbers vary, but it's in the thousands, right, right. tens of thousands of people. And most, I'm sure, didn't hear Lincoln, but that's almost besides the point. Right, you there, just want to witness there, history, you're part of it. So that's amazing, though. I mean, so and and what did they do with these four hundred and fifty thousand people? Were they just in for the day, or I mean, obviously they can't support that many people staying here overnight. No, no, no. And, and um, you know, by and large, they would come and then they would they would leave. Uh, many, many, many did. Yeah, many, many, many did. But and camping wasn't so odd back then for people to do. So like they could have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could do, drive out to Misho or somewhere else, perhaps in camp. But again, the idea that I'm going to be there, I'm going to see the president. Right. I'm going to take part in this moment that's kind of the 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 last punctuation mark in the, the narrative of the Civil War. I'm going to be yeah. there to see it. <clears throat> Man. And did most of them arrive by train or automobile? Automobile is huge. Automobile, automobile is huge. The automobile age. Uh, this, which is certainly not to say the train's not operating, bringing people in. They had special trains. But by and large, it's automobiles. Mm. Chris, were these v- veterans aware of the prayer, if I can call it that, on the peace light, the words are peace eternal in a nation united? Were they cognizant that I, as a guide anyway, would would frame it this way on a tour, that here were these men, average age around 94, at their last reunion, praying that we would have peace eternal in a nation united and isn't that something that we really need today in a very divided country? I wonder how much they yeah. would hear me say that and say, no, nah, that's just your 21st century interpretation. We weren't even aware. That wasn't our push. That was some other sculptor who put that up there. Well, you know, I think the interesting thing is the idea for a peace memorial at Gettysburg comes from the veterans. And because even during the 1913 awesome. reunion, Andrew Cowan, who's a famous oh, yeah. artillery commander during the battle, he gets up and actually makes a pitch for it. And they create this kind of peace memorial committee following the 13 reunion that has some big names on it. Joshua Chamberlain is on the committee. He's the president. Uh, Vander of it, Law is big names, but it quickly loses traction. Chamberlain, among others, dies. World War erupts in Europe. The minds of Americans move elsewhere, and the idea kind of becomes dormant, and it's not revived again until the 38 reunion. So the idea that on the battlefield somewhere. There's going to be this kind of tangible uh, uh, argument for peace mm. comes from the veterans themselves. Mm. It doesn't get placed on the battlefield to the 38 till 38. But the idea originates with the men that, that is really moving. Yeah. So it even supports even more that narrative that the veterans are thinking about peace for us. Do you know where the words came from? Peace United or peace eternal in a nation. I don't. United. I know. Okay. I, I, I don't. don't. I mean, I know the. Uh, the committee, the Pennsylvania committee accepted submissions for the monument. Uh, they got a number of them. Obviously, they went with Paul Philippe Cray, who had also done some some work uh, at World War I battlefields and cemeteries. So if you ever go over there, the, the style is very reminiscent. How they came about with that inscription, I, I don't know. But I think it's a very eloquent and a very apt Absolutely. way to to frame that monument right. ideologically. I believe it was during the lecture you had um, 
said something about how, uh, you know, in the, the early memorialization period, um, the veterans were men who held office. They, they, they were sure, yeah. active. They were still young and they were so they, they held office in Many, you know, yeah. federal office and whatever. And so uh, the monuments and memorials, it was, uh, you know, they were very prolific in getting them up because they were that was their generation and it was their time and all that. And they were in power. As they get older and they're retiring and now younger people are in the halls of Congress and they've got bigger fish to fry with the world war looming and, you know, everything's changing and everything like that. Um, I, I seem to get the sense that you were kind of saying that um, people were losing interest in their whole thing. It wasn't like we look at it, you know, uh, in this little world, we all look at them with like such awe, you know, but then they were kind of looking at them. Maybe I would think kind of the way. When I was coming up, the way because there were still World War One veterans alive when I was a little kid, and I remember seeing things about them on TV and everything, I couldn't care less because I didn't know any of them. But my grandfather was in World War Two, and so that was what was cool, World mm -hmm. War Two. And so I, I'm wondering if it's kind of the same thing where it's just like, yeah, I have no connection to that. I really don't care, and we've got this going on now. Um, so. I mean, was it that way or is that just the way I'm, I'm interpreting it where the, the, the people by 1938, the, the American people were kind of just like, Meh, it's a cute novelty or, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Well, I think they looked on it with a certain, um, romance, certainly. Okay. A, a kind of sanitized view of the past. I think that time marches on as it does. And mm -hmm. the, the pressing needs of of now and the future uh particularly during the 1930s were very significant right and um i think there was also a concern that dusting off this kind of very uh contested and divisive chapter in american past whether or not that was something that you know you, does america really need it right now what I would say, and I believe this is, is very true, is that the 38 reunion is much more of a reflection of society in 1938 than it is necessarily about the, the veterans uh, or the, the 1863 generation. Well, that's something that's come up a lot so far on the show when we talk about these things is that the memorializations and um, uh, commemorations of these events and these people are have more to do with the people putting up the memorials than they do the people who actually are being Absolutely. memorialized. And that's very true. And you go and uh, when we're talking about the peace light and we're talking about Franklin Roosevelt who comes to help uh, dedicate it. Mm -hmm. Roosevelt offers up a speech and Roosevelt in his, his remarks talks much more about the challenges of the present mm. and the challenges of the future than he does about the past. But right. he uses this moment, this reunion of, of veterans as an example of what Americans can do and together mm. united as brothers and as countrymen, there's you know nothing that we can't uh, tackle. Right. Looking to the past to have a stronger yeah, future. Yeah, sure, yeah. sure. Well, it's like uh, Bob brings up a lot. What was it, Bob, after, um, what was it um, when they read the Gettysburg Address for 9-11? What was the event? Was it a... It was the first anniversary. The first anniversary. 9-11. At the mo moment that the first plane hit the first tower, a bell was rung. And from Washington on television, George Bush announced there would be a moment of silence. Right. That moment of silence was broken in that very moving moment by the Gettysburg Address. Yeah. There you go. So same idea, right? Um, all right. So, oh, one more thing. Um Funny little anecdotes that you uh, might have from the reunion. I'm thinking of one man who caught a baseball game. Yeah, there, so there's a lot of them. <laughs> and that was the, the, real, the real joy of doing this research was not just f coming across these funny stories, but these were windows into the, the men that fought the Civil War. Sure. Uh, so there's one man that during the reunion goes MIA, goes missing. His name's John, James Hancock. And he's one of the few MIAs that just didn't know what happened to him. Well, he hitchhiked to Philadelphia and they found him at a baseball game asleep. Uh, there's, um, which is remarkable to me because there was no uh, turnpike, right? At that point, you got a guy who's, you know, <laughs> like a century, yeah, he's a century old and he's busy hitchhiking his way to Philadelphia. That's a remarkable story. <laughs> Uh, and that they find him alive and well watching a baseball yeah. game. It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, what else? Uh, you have um, 
you have men that begin to charge for autographs uh, to okay. make money because they, they're, they're celebrities, right? Sure. It's, I mean, even last year at the Eisenhower uh, World War II weekend, you could go and you could chat with a World War II veteran and get your book or pamphlet signed. The same kind of premise yeah. in 1938. I'm sure. going to get Civil War veteran to sign my uh, <laughs> sign my autograph book, and there's one that just started charging people a dime a signature, and he, he racked up some money nice. from it. How about that? <laughs> there's a uh, weren't there some faux generals? There were. Uh, there's a, a number of individuals, and we spoke a little bit about this earlier, yeah. who claimed to have served in the Confederate Army, who claimed to be you know 105 years old, and it turns out that in actuality, you know, they were. 10 years old during the war and they simply claimed to be a confederate veteran i think initially to collect a pension yeah but if you were a veteran and you came to this this reunion you were a you're a quasi celebrity sure. right yeah. and it's kind of the same way with world war ii now you want to connect with that person because it's a, a tangible piece of history right right and you get to interact with them you get to become part of that yeah. story and so uh john sailing i believe was his name and he was uh he was not a confederate veteran though he claims to be and then but there was some I, I don't know if it was here or not or maybe it was uh 1913 but what wasn't weren't there some guys that came in generals uniforms that were never generals well, there were many but what they were they claimed to be generals in the united confederate veterans so oh, your rank in that oh, organization didn't necessarily uh, okay, uh, okay. connect with your rank during the uh gotcha the service. I mean, a fantastic example of that is a man by the name of um Gillette, O.R. Gillette, okay. who held the rank of general in the United Confederate Veterans, though he was never a general in the, in the war. <laughs> okay. uh, he was a Gettysburg. He was a Gettysburg veteran. And uh, he um, uh, was a survivor of Pickett's Charge. And so he's this mm. you know, grand celebrity sure. during the reunion. And uh, he, he relished the role. And uh, as the reunion kind of progressed, and as I think he came to the realization that the bigger the story he told, the more attention he got, his participation in the war went from something you're relatively modest, right? Which is not to say that I mean he was a Pickett's Charge sure, survivor. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. remarkable in and of itself. Absolutely. But, you know, by the end of the reunion, he was neighbors with Jefferson Davis. He learned <laughs> how to play the banjo from Jeb Stewart, and uh, you know, his, his story took on these kind of epic dimensions. And yeah. He had a. Uh, he was like the Forrest Gump of the Confederate. He was Army. the Forrest Gump. You everywhere. Yep. <laughs> yeah. He did it all. Uh, he uh, was very eager to invite people into his tent. He had this jug of. Uh, whiskey that he'd you know pass around and he really embraced the role uh and uh, you know expounded upon it to some degree yeah that's cool that's cool and speaking of drinking one of the uh the true calamities during the reunion was that uh, after the first day the the booze ran out so if you were a, a oh, veteran geez. you got to go and get free um free hot toddies or uh you know uh shot of whiskey spiritus, or something spiritus liquors whenever whenever you wanted to really <laughs> And the veterans just consumed these enormous quantities of booze. And it became such a, a pressing issue that the Army dispatched a plane to go and pick up more booze uh, and bring uh, it to the uh, reunion. Chris, I was going to ask about this anyway, but there's a Boy Scout escort living yes. in the tent with every veteran, correct? The, the Boy Scouts are brought in to basically act as pages, if you will, for okay. these veterans. So by and large, you would be paired up with a veteran. Your job is to take care of this man, tend to his needs. Uh, you know, uh, make sure he's alive, put him back on the train at the end of the reunion. And, you know, so I, I, I'm seeing the temptation of some veteran telling his Boy Scout page, go get go, me a yeah, toddy. Go get me a toddy. <laughs> yeah. It probably happened. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. And he taking some as he's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they ran out so fast. <laughs> Matt's thinking, yep, that's, that's what, what I'm doing. Scout is siphoning <laughs> off the uh, booze. I heard a story once, um, I forget who who I heard it from, but um, a Boy Scout, a guy who was a Boy Scout at the time, when he was older, told a story about how he was escorting a Confederate veteran who wanted to rewalk Pickett's Charge. Yeah. You know the story? I do, I do. Go ahead. It's a um, uh, young scout who's still alive. Uh, you know, he, Today? Today, yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, at least he was a few years ago. And he was a scout, and in 1938, he's paired up with this old Confederate veteran. And this man said, this guy looked exactly like you would think a 97-year-old Confederate veteran would look. You know, he had the, the long gray beard, he had the ragged jacket, and uh, his job is to keep this man alive. Get him <laughs> right. off the train, four right. days later, put him back in the train. 
And they, uh, on July 3rd, around the time of the Pickett's charge, this old Confederate veteran wants to walk the route. And so they set off and they, they walk it. And uh, as they approach the Union battle line, the Confederate veteran just stops in his tracks and he mm. stops the scout and he takes off his hat and he parts his hair with his fingers and shows the scout this scar in his head and his skull from where on July 3rd, 1863, at the height of the attack, he'd been hit in the head by an artillery shell fragment. And obviously he lived, but that scout never forgot that moment. Mm, oh, yeah. And I can imagine. And again, only a few years ago, this man's still alive telling this story. Right, and sure. so we were talking earlier about, you know, it seems like a long time, but it's really not. No, that's, yeah. Like, I, I've a, given two tours to people that were those Boy Scouts. They were here, yeah. Yeah, yeah. they're still around. I would yeah, love to get a hold around. of one of them and, and have them on. Ah, that would be How good. cool would that be? Do you know who this guy is? Uh, I have his name, yeah. And, um, you know, one of the, the remarkable things is, um, it's the, really the World War II generation, right? Yeah. And so... We're, we're basically right now at the World War II generation, where, where in the Civil War in 1938. Sure, was, was 75 yeah. years ago this yeah. past we're at that We're at the there 75th anniversary of, yeah. of the Second World War. Wow. So these men that were Boy Scouts were, are now in their 80s and 90s. Jeez. Yeah. Battle of the Bulge, 75 yeah. years ago next week as yeah. we sit. Yeah, yeah. And I'm finding it. Every day, <laughs> says Matt as he hits the bulge <laughs> above his waist. Uh, all right. Well, Chris, this is great. What uh, what lecture are you working on for this winter? Are you doing one? Oh, I am doing one. It's going to be a little bit different than uh, some of the programs I've tackled in the past. And okay. what we're going to do is take a look at the experience of battle on Culp's Hill. And nice. it's really inspired to a degree by a very famous book called The Face of Battle by John Keegan. Okay. Uh, which, you know, most military historians, oh, yeah. I'm sure, are very familiar with that. But what he does is he really examines and tries to drill down what the experience of battle is. So what does yeah. it feel like? What does it look like? What does it smell like? Um, to do a couple things. One, um, as much as we can, try to, try to understand, okay, what, what is it like to be in a Civil War battle? But also my, my hope is to humanize some of the individuals who, who participated in it. And the fighting on Culp's Hill, I think, for the battle is, is very unique. Yeah, It's a yeah. you know, frontal assault against an entrenched fixed position. It's night fighting. And most of the men that participated in the fighting on Culp's Hill did not write about it in these kind of glowing, romantic, chivalrous <laughs> ways. Right. You know, it was, a, it was a slog. It was a brutal, brutal engagement that in... A lot of ways was the um, the uh, the prologue to what was to come. Mm -hmm. So let's hope we don't have a government shutdown this year. Yeah, no I know. comment. Well, <laughs> well if, the, it, if, I hope not. if there is and you can't do it, uh, I hope you could come back and talk about we'll it here. We'll talk about it. I can't wait to. Yeah. That'll be great. Yeah. Do you have a date for that yet? That, oh, geez, we do have the date posted. Uh, go oh, to www.nps.gov slash G-E-T-T -T for the full schedule. And you can also visit the park online uh, via Facebook, Gettysburg National awesome. Military Park. So I had a couple questions. I don't know if you just oh, want to keep no. this running. I could ask off the air, too, if you want. But uh, you, you had mentioned about the, <coughs> the Confederate flag yeah. uh, issue. And I... I got you to where uh, Mr. Roy, Paul Roy, was in Texas, and he's trying to convince these guys they can bring their flags. Bring and then the flag, he goes yeah. to Grand Rapids, yeah. talking to the GAR convention. And uh, and he said that, well, the flags will be over there in the Confederate camp, yeah. which isn't like a mile away as the lines are, <laughs> but it would be just across <laughs> the Gettysburg Road. Road. Yeah. Right, at yeah. <laughs> Gettysburg College. So were there any issues, though, about the flag while the veterans were here? No, not during the 38 reunion. Okay. Uh, there's always this level of tension that just kind of lives beneath the surface. And if you look at the kind of the opening ceremonies that take place at the college, uh, the uh, commander of the Grand Army of the Republic, Overton Mennett, makes a very kind of well choreographed, eloquent speech. And then John Claypool, who's the commander of the United Confederate Veterans, gets up and makes this kind of off the cuff remark. Um, and in both of these speeches, in very different ways, these men are trying to say, listen, we're happy to be here. We're happy that the country is reunited. But again, 
just because a loss doesn't mean I'm wrong and or we won and we were right. Mm -hmm. So there, and what I, what I mean when I say that is that there are limits to this idea of reconciliation. Mm. Uh, it's not like these guys just brushed it all under the rug and moved on and everything's happy go lucky. The country's back together again. No, that's not how it was. Uh, there were limits to it. And the, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, um, these men were more than willing to usually come back together to shake hands. Uh, but that should not be misconstrued as any kind of uh, admission of, of wrongdoing or any kind of um, uh, neglect of, of what these men had fought for as, as, as younger men. Was the, the lost cause theory um, yeah. expressed at all at the 75th anniversary? Oh, absolutely. I would say in, in many, many ways, the entire thing is kind of a, a example lost of cause yeah. Uh, example, yeah. So the idea that you know we're going to bring these these veterans back together, we're not going to talk about what the war was about. We're not really going to dwell on slavery. We're not going to dwell on causation. We're not going to we're not going to worry about those things. This is a time to honor the men who fought in the war, and leave those more kind of divisive and contested issues aside. Mm -hmm. Which is and and the Confederate battle flag. The reason it is such a contested and divisive symbol, even in 1938, is because it is the tangible representation of those things. Uh, for the Union mm. veterans, that is a symbol of, of treason and slavery. And for Confederate veterans, that is a symbol of courage and fidelity. And, mm -hmm. um, and it, it metastasizes into this this incredibly divisive symbol mm. which it still is today and yeah. what would be the african-american view at the 38 well, and that that is i think fascinating in researching i was anticipating that the african-american press uh the baltimore african-american afro-american is a great example of this uh, the local newspaper i thought they were going to shred the reunion to trash it as this kind of lost cause celebration they wrote about it in glowing terms mm. And as many as, as 50, 60 USCT veterans, United States Colored Troops veterans, attend the event. And uh, it's a segregated event. It's segregated not racially, but sectionally. So the Confederate camps on one side, the Union camps on the other. And some of these, these African Americans who came from Baltimore, they went to segregated schools, they ate at segregated restaurants, they sat in segregated seating at theaters, they go to the Gettysburg reunion, they sit in the mess hall, and the guy to the right is a, you know, is white, white is guy. Yeah. veteran of the second Wisconsin, the guy on the left is a, you know, a rebel from Virginia, and so it's this moment where the mm. African American newspapers write about it like the color line has been erased. Huh. Uh, and so it's this moment that is in, in these African American newspapers lauded as this kind of groundbreaking event. But again, at the end, the African Americans go back to mm. segregated Baltimore and they right. go back to where they're from and you know, face the same you know, racial prejudices that characterize most of the sure. 20th century. It would be interesting, I think, to hear a lecture by you or someone else comparing or, or tracing in these anniversaries this whole reconciliation, lost cause kind of thing from the, the African American perspective and bring it at least all the way to the 100th anniversary in 1963. Oh, yeah. Because I think George Wallace was around. Uh, I know he was alive, certainly. Yeah, Wallace but I think is he was attendance. here at Gettysburg in, this, in the 60s. Yeah, but, Wallace, yeah. Um, actually, Wallace is at the, uh, at the first. 100th? He's at the 100. He's at the our park amphitheater on West Confederate Avenue. He's at the first showing of the park amphitheater. Hmm. This is a strange thing. I mean, we still do campfire programs there today and to think that Wallace has some role in it's, you know, kind of a And he was there in what capacity? As a dignitary. As a dignitary. Oh, he was. Yeah. <laughs> He's, um, oh, wait, this was in 1963 when that, when was that? The Centennial Office is in, in 1963. Yeah. No, 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 but when was the amphitheater? Uh, actually, I want to say it's in the late 50s. Okay. Don't quote me on that. Okay. Though. It's been around a long time. But before the centennial. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it wasn't built for the centennial. No. no, no, no. I would love to, to hear more about Wallace here at Gettysburg and what impact that might have had on the African-American community as a whole and their embracing 
Mm -hmm. This is part of their history, too. What I do know or not because of what happened. Yeah. And it's an absolutely fascinating chapter in the kind of the Gettysburg story. I do know Jill Titus, who's a professor at Gettysburg College, is working on a study of that kind of era Mm. of of park history now. And I'm really looking forward to it because I think she's going to uncover some really fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple other pretty technical questions, I guess, but you might want to cut these out. Um, Albert Wilson, I mentioned him earlier, the last Northern veteran to die who wasn't at the battle. Do we know if he was here for the night? He was in attendance. He was in attendance. Yeah. He was in attendance in 1938. Very good. And how about this Confederate who claimed he was the last Confederate? Was his name Williams? I think at least the Walter Williams. Yeah. Yeah. Walter Williams. Oh, it likely wasn't. He likely wasn't. Um, the last veteran to die was most likely Albert Wilson. Okay. There were, um, and there's been a number of good studies of this. Uh, most likely Williams was not actually, uh, in the Confederate armed forces it wasn't in the confederate military but again in the post-war period you could claim to be it was relatively easy to do comparatively speaking you could get a pension and it 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 gave you a kind of celebrity status Mm -hmm. and so most likely williams was not um there i'm trying to think of the name of the last verified confederate veteran to pass he dies in the early 50s Oh, it's gonna it's gonna bug me now. Isn't there a film of of that? Not him dying, but like a news report. The PBS documentary has yeah. a has a picture of Williams and they yeah. don't decry. They they claim they don't they don't they don't have the it. caveats of the yeah, refutation yeah, yeah, yeah. it Chris yeah. just brought up. Yeah. They claim, you know, because it's no but the guy a, you're thinking of though, not Williams. Not Williams, no. I don't want to say his name. It's it begins with a C. It's Cump or Clump. Something like yeah, that. Darn it. So um, another one, you mentioned the 1887 uh, Philadelphia Brigade and Pickett's veterans shaking hands over the wall yeah. at the angle there. Um, was that the biggest thing? Well, compare that to the next year, which would have been the 25th anniversary. 25th anniversary, if you look at it, the, it, it does not e- does not meet expectations. It's a, a relatively modest affair, to be honest. Okay. And so to get back to um, these these. You know, joint blue-gray reunions, they simply didn't happen a whole lot. Mm -hmm. They get a lot of attention, but it's relatively rare. Now, I do know, I want to say it's the 25th anniversary of the Longstreet's in attendance. Do you know that, Bob? I don't. I've read it. I just can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. I do know they did not get the number of veterans back to the battlefield that they'd hoped. The total number of veterans that would have visited in 1888... it, would it have eclipsed 1887, though? I mean, oh, that's a good question. I don't I, think so, no. But it, don't, really? don't, don't quote okay. me on that. Don't it just, quote me it, on it that. It seemed to me on the face of it that that's the 25th anniversary. You'd think you'd be bigger than yeah. it was. And I, I think, um, again, from what I've heard, it was a relatively modest okay. event, certainly compared to 1913. Mm-hmm. I think that the interesting thing about the Philadelphia Brigade and Pickett's Division is the novelty of it. It was the first time that that really happened. Mm. You know, John Batchelder, um, early, early on, tries to get the chief historian of the National y- Park. Yeah, he's the first real kind of government historian of the battlefield, mm. casts a huge shadow. He very early on communicates with a lot of the high ranking officers. He tries to get them together to uh, return to the battlefield and to mark the landscape. And, you know, many Union veterans uh, take part in this. Relatively few Confederate veterans do. And there's this wonderful uh, letter that Lee writes to, I want to say David McConaughey. It's in the collection of uh, Gettysburg College today. You're familiar with this letter, Bob? No. Uh, Basically, it's an invitation for Lee to come back to the battlefield. I want to say this is 1867. Oh, okay. Don't call me on that. You you can remove this whole thing, but it's a fascinating letter. (laughs) Um, But Lee basically makes the argument, no, I'm not going to come back. One, because I don't have anything new to say. And two, I don't think it's a good idea to keep open the uh, sores of war or yeah. something to that effect. It's better to kind of uh, assign it to oblivion and let the you know, the scars of war heal. Some of that, you got to check that letter out. It's a, fast, a fascinating okay. letter. So Crump. Crump, thank you. Pleasant Crump. Pleasant Crump. Um, <clears throat> according to this, no. Is this is Wikipedia? <laughs> yeah. So take it for what it's worth. But um, he was uh, December 31st, 1951. There's oh, so one, he's one of the, two, uh, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 10, 11, 12, with the 12th one being Williams m- on this chart after him okay. throughout the whole 50s. Is there one named Sterling on there? A Virginian? Uh, yeah, uh, 
Sa- Saling? Saling. John yeah, he B. Was, Saling? Yeah. He was uh, one of the um, men that almost assuredly was not in the Confederate, Confederate Army, but claimed to be and came to the reunion. He said he was... Um, Oh, in his hundreds. Well, because he's seven years old in 1865. Yeah, because like it says here his claim date of birth is 1846. His believed birth date is 1856. Yeah, there you go, yeah. So yeah, so he's a wee boy. <laughs> Chris, thanks very much for coming. It was great having you on. I love talking about this. I'm looking forward to your winter lecture this year about Culps Hill, and uh, everybody go check that out. And when you uh, when you're going to be doing it, and uh, I'm telling you, you got to come here during the winter. Because there's stuff to do, and it's not crowded with people. And you don't have to wait 45 minutes to get a table at a restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Matt and Bob, thank you very much. For yeah, no, thank truly. you very much. Thank you, Chris. And thank you for listening.